the China DPRK Friendship Tower at the foot of Moran Hill in Pyongyang. For decades, this monument has testified to the achievements of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army in the Korean War and commemorated their sacrifice. On June 21, 2019, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee Xi Jinping and his wife Peng Li Yuan pay homage to the China DPRK Friendship Tower during a state visit. Kamiantanjungli it was thanks to this victory that China secured the peace and stability necessary for the development of the newly founded People's Republic. But this war was not the only challenge facing the Chinese people during these years. Rebuilding an already war-ravaged country and establishing the socialist economic and political system that would provide the foundation for the growth of new China were also matters that needed to be urgently addressed. On June 25, 1950, when the Korean War broke out, the U.S. immediately began its armed intervention. The U.S. 7th Fleet was also sent to China's Taiwan Strait to obstruct China's reunification. In early October, U.S.-led forces, ignoring the Chinese government's repeated warnings, crossed the 38th parallel. Their approach to the Chinese border presented a serious threat to China's national security. It was at this critical moment that the Korean Workers' Party and the DPRK government turned to China for assistance. But given the disparities in strength, would sending Chinese troops to the DPRK guarantee victory or merely involve China in a protracted struggle that would smother its economic development? This was the urgent question facing the political bureau of the CPC Central Committee as events unfolded. After consideration of the situation, the historic decision was made to aid Korea resist the U.S. and keep China safe. On October 8, Mao Zedong issued the order. A Chinese People's Volunteer Army would be formed with Peng De Huai as the commander and political commissar. Just over a week later, on October 19, the Chinese People's Volunteer Army, or CPVA, crossed the Yalu River and entered the Korean War. In close cooperation with DPRK soldiers and civilians, the CPVA fought five fierce battles in Anjong, Unsan, Chungcheon River, and Chosin Reservoir, one after the other, establishing a stable defensive position from which it launched a series of offensives. Surviving the US's Operation Strangle and biological warfare, winning a number of major battles, including the bloody Battle of Triangle Hill, the heroism of the Chinese People's Volunteers is unparalleled. This is the 
，一个是水石头，一个是那炮弹炸的，一个是人的骨头，就这三种东西：石头、炮弹炸、弹皮和人的骨头。时间要打多久？我讲我们不要做决定。有，过去是有到了门。以后是有二十号位二，或者美国的将来的什么总统由他们去决定。就是说，他们要打多久就打多久，一次打到完全胜利At the time, Chinese people were united with the desire to win. Tens of thousands volunteered to join the army and fight in the Korean Peninsula. At home, meanwhile, the emphasis was on increasing production and strict economy for the sake of the war effort. As of May 1952, the amount of money donated was enough to buy 3,710 fighter jets, providing vital air cover for the CPVA. After an unprecedented defeat, the United Nations forces, headed by the United States, had to sign the Korean Armistice Agreement on July 27, 1953. The war to resist US aggression and aid Korea, that lasted two years and nine months, officially ended with the aggressor's retreat to the south of the 38th parallel from the Yalu River. It was a victory for peace, a victory for justice, and a victory for the people. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. In bloody battles fought by the CPVA, more than 300,000 heroes emerged, men such as Yang Gen Si, Huang Ji Guang, and Cho Xiao Yun, among countless others. It was a war in which at least 6,000 military units distinguished themselves for their heroism, and over 197,000 soldiers died martyrs' deaths, including Mao Zedong's son, Mao An Ying, the People's Army remained dearest to the hearts of the Chinese people to this very day. It was also a war in which the Chinese military gained important experience, enabling it to push forward its modernization. Beijing In the 1950s, the People's Liberation Army made significant headway in becoming a more revolutionary, modernized and standardized army, developing from a single branch armed force into a multi-branch one. The Chinese people were now protected by a brand new armed service.
Ever since the founding of the People's Republic of China, the country had dedicated itself to developing its economy. On January 1, 1953, the People's Daily introduced people to a novel idea, the first five-year plan. It was connected with the Communist Party of China's concerted national effort to achieve industrialization. At a meeting of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee on June 15th, Mao Zedong formally put forward a general line for the transition period, which detailed that the transition period refers to the period from the founding of the People's Republic of China to the basic completion of socialist transformation. The general line, or the general task of the party for this transition period, was basically to accomplish the industrialization of China and the socialist transformation of agriculture, handicraft sector and capitalist industry and commerce over a fairly long period of time. Industrialization is an essential precondition for prosperity and independence. These early years of the PRC were a time during which scarcely a day passed without a major project starting or being successfully completed. It was a time of great excitement up and down the country, with Chinese workers, farmers and intelligentsia all united by a common desire to see industrialization completed. On December 26, 1953, the Anshan Iron and Steel Company's three big projects started operation. The heavy steel rolling mill, seamless steel tube mill, and the seventh blast furnace. 1956年7月13日,汽车厂建厂三周年的前两天,第一辆汽车诞生了。从今天起,中国不能制造汽车的历史结束了。China's first five-year plan prioritized the development of heavy industry and involved 156 key projects assisted and supported by the Soviet Union. In just a few years, cars, tractors, airplanes, watches, televisions, items seldom seen in the country up until then, were all being manufactured in China. And with the magnificent achievements of large-scale infrastructure construction, in 1956, the main targets detailed in the first five-year plan were reached one year ahead of schedule. In just a few years, the PRC had produced much more than China had in the previous century. At the end of April in 1956, the National Conference of Advanced Workers' Representatives was held in Beijing. Over 5,500 attendees participated. <laughs> The nationwide construction of the new China saw the emergence of a number of model workers and advanced figures across society. Foreigners also contributed their time and wisdom. Chinese people, all proud of the country's progress, gave their full trust to the Communist Party and the new China. According to the general line for the transition period, Socialist transformations also took place in agriculture, handicrafts, and capitalist industry and commerce. A special attention had to be paid to the fundamental basis of any national economy, agriculture. As the economic development geared up and scaled up, food shortages began to reveal themselves. Increasing grain production as rapidly as possible 
became a number one priority. The CPC Central Committee deemed the collectivization of agriculture the best way of achieving this. Therefore, to guide farmers along the road to collectivization, the government established mutual aid teams and later primary and advanced agricultural producers cooperatives. By the end of 1956, the number of advanced agricultural producers cooperatives had grown to 540,000, 87.8% of total agricultural households. Simultaneously, the CPC was also socializing China's handicraft sector. By the end of 1956, the handicraft industry had basically been transformed from a sector dominated by small private concerns to one in which collective enterprises dominated. Time-honored brands withstood this transition, just as Mao Zedong said, don't let our fine handicraft products be discarded. Knives and scissors brands like Wang Ma Tzu and Zhang Xiaochuan should never be discarded, not even in 10,000 years. For larger private concerns, CPC policy was voluntary nationalization. Over time, the private sector with due compensation was nationalized. In 1954, then 38-year-old Rong Yiren was first to cooperate with the Shanghai government and adopt the Joint State-Private Ownership Scheme for all of his enterprises. By the end of 1956, it was adopted for the entire capitalist industry and commerce of the country. By 1956, the transition was basically complete. China's economy had now fundamentally changed in structure, with the means of production in public hands and the principle of distribution according to work thoroughly entrenched. For the first time in its history, a basic socialist economic system had been established in China. In addition to economic transition, socialist construction in the political field proceeded apace. In July 1953, the election of deputies to local people's congresses was launched nationwide. 85.88% of the entire electorate voted in this election. Mao Zedong Nearly 300 million voters participated in the election and cast their votes. They were now truly the masters of their own country. On the afternoon of December 24, 1953, a train departed from Beijing railway station. On this train sat Mao Zedong, just about to celebrate his 60th birthday, and a team of legal draftsmen, and they were bound for a special conference in Hangzhou. In the 77 days that followed their arrival in Hangzhou, they drafted the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, a major event that laid the foundations for the new China's legal system. On June 16, 1954, People's Daily published the full text of the draft constitution along with an editorial calling for national discussion. September 15, 1954, 
the much-anticipated grand opening of the first session of the first National People's Congress at Huairen Hall in Zhongnanhai, Beijing. The 1954 Constitution was the first fundamental law of the People's Republic of China, providing a general guideline for governance and a concentrated expression of the will of the CPC and Chinese people. It adopts socialism and people's democracy as the basic principles, determines a state system and government system that is suitable for China's national conditions and stipulates fully the fundamental rights and duties of Chinese citizens. 9月 at this meeting, Mao Zedong was elected chairman of the People's Republic of China. Zhu De was elected vice chairman and Liu Xiaoqi was elected chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, while Mao Zedong nominated Zhou Enlai, Premier of the State Council. In December 1954, at the first session of the Second National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the CPP-CC Charter was adopted. This reaffirmed the CPPCC as the People's Democratic United Front and confirmed the necessity of its continued existence. After the promulgation of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, regional ethnic autonomy was fully implemented as a basic national policy and a guiding principle of the political system and government systems for ethnic autonomous areas were gradually constructed in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution. Now that the Chinese people were finally the undisputed masters of their own country, the time had come to turn attention to other matters. Education was an especially pressing issue, with large numbers of people unable to read or write. Now they got their chance to receive education. With the construction of socialism, all aspects of ordinary people's lives were undergoing radical and positive change. Everything was new and everything was improved. Life was hopeful. So far, under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, this eastern country, home to a quarter of the world's population, had been successfully navigated a course through the greatest and most profound social transformation in Chinese history, laying the political and institutional foundations for the subsequent development of the country. Oh, 
出复兴，为业征途。